Hello, welcome to the Massachusetts General Hospital Community Forum Friday. My name is Katie Brandt. I'm the Director of Caregiver Support Services and Public Relations, and I'll be your host for today's session, Grief Supports for Children and Families, a conversation led by our own Caregiver Support Specialist, Amy Marcazano, and Community Expert, Cami Adler-Roth, Children's Program Manager from Care Dimensions. Many of you know that our Community Forum Fridays webinar series is geared towards bringing information that's relevant to your experience of a life lived with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, frontal temporal dementia, and related disorders. Today's topic may be especially relevant for families that have a child or a young adult in their lives. We hope that the information brought to you by our, our two expert speakers will help you navigate some difficult moments, family conversations with love and care. I'd love to begin by introducing Amy Marcazano. Amy is a licensed mental health clinician and works in the MGH FTD unit as a caregiver support specialist. Her background includes working in clinics and emergency departments and providing mental health services for families in the community. I think that that aligns Amy especially well for this interview today. And Cami Adler-Roth, our community expert, is a licensed independent clinical social worker and certified child life specialist who has worked with children and families in a variety of settings to help them understand and cope with challenging life events, including serious illness, end of life, and grief. She has experience working in school settings, hospitals, grief centers, and clients' homes. Cami's career began in 2012 at Boston Medical Center's Spark Center, supporting medically fragile infants and toddlers. At that time, she also began volunteering as a grief group facilitator at the Children's Room, a center for grieving families and teens in Arlington, Massachusetts. Cami worked as a child life specialist in Dell Children's Medical Center of Central Texas in the emergency department, intensive care unit, and oncology clinic. Currently, as a children's program manager at Care Dimension, she offers anticipatory grief and bereavement support to children and their families. Cami is passionate about supporting children through play, fostering human connection, and meeting families exactly where they are. Amy, I'd like to welcome you to the program today. Thank you, Katie. I'm very excited to be here today talking about this really important topic with Cami. Amy, I know how critically important mental health is to you, but also the dynamics and the mental health supports for families. And so that's why I know that your heart is really in today's session. And I'm excited to turn the program over to you for your conversation with Cami. Thank you so much. And welcome, Cami. So glad to have you joining us today. We know that this is also an important topic to your heart as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. So Cami, I just wanted to begin by asking you, um, could you tell us a little bit about your program at Care Dimensions and the services that your organization offers? Absolutely. Um, so Care Dimensions is a hospice, palliative care and support services organization. Um, we're a nonprofit serving Eastern Massachusetts, um, over 100 communities in Eastern Massachusetts. Um, and so we're really supporting patients who have serious illness or maybe nearing the end of life um, and their families. And <clears throat> So we have a lot of specialized programs um, and we support families, what, what patients, whether they're in their homes or maybe at a facility. Um, and one of the um, really important programs that Care Dimensions offers is our grief support programs. And so um, my role really at Care Dimensions is um, as the children's program manager um, offering um, 
supports to families who have young children, grandchildren, um, or children, direct children of a patient, maybe a niece or nephew, anticipating the death of somebody in their life um, or grieving the death of somebody. Um, and our services are available to anybody in our community, um, regardless of whether they've accessed Care Dimensions services or not. Thank you, that's so important. And thank you for that clarification about the eligibility. I think it's so important that people have resources and your program sounds wonderful. And as we begin our discussion around grief supports for families, could you define some of the terms that might help families navigate a conversation with us? Um, I noticed you mentioned anticipatory grief. Could you talk about that or ambiguous loss? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a lot of different kind of terms and words that we use um, to help really um, put names to some of the experiences that families and children often have um, when they're moving through this type of experience. Um, so the first word that you might have heard me use was anticipatory grief, um, which you mentioned, Amy. And, and that really, um, what that means is we're really thinking about all of the feelings of loss that are experienced when someone is in when there is a death impending or a loss that's impending we're expecting it um, and that can include all of the different types of losses that are experienced as an illness progresses um, Another word that we'll use a lot today, um, which is probably a familiar word, um, but there's, um, I think it's still helpful to define, um, is the word grief. And so grief really is um, simply put, although it's not a simple experience, um, it's a response to loss that can be emotional, physical, cognitive, spiritual. It really impacts us from all different angles and is experienced in many different ways. And so we'll explore that a little bit, what it can look like in um, children in particular. Um, a couple of other words might be um, secondary losses, which are um, losses that are experienced as a result of somebody's illness or death. Um, so that might include changes in um, a relationship or the way that a family is structured, changes in routines, finances, um, or general changes in, um, in a family's lifestyle. Um, and the last word that might be helpful to name is ambiguous loss, which I think you mentioned, Damien. And that really, um, that is an important one to think about because it's, it's really talks about the losses that can be hard to pinpoint um, and that we might not necessarily, um, there are sort of losses that are uncertain, right? So it's about not knowing exactly what's to come or what's, um, what the loss is. There's, it's a, a lack of understanding um, and knowing that there is significant loss at once. I think that's a really important point as we think about children, especially, and when folks that are experiencing life with a diagnosis of dementia, we know that there are so many losses on so many levels and changes, as you mentioned. So thank you for that. Uh, so important. When you're talking with families, Cami, um, whether it's during hospice care or after a loss, what are some of the most you know, common questions that you may receive from uh, parents or caregivers or an adult? That's a great question, Amy. And I think, um, I think the most common questions are um, really around what can I do to support my child, right? Um, and how much information should I share and when should I share it? And what language should I be using? and how involved or not involved should my child be in this process. Um, families, um, of course, want to do everything they can to protect their children and make these really difficult life experiences, um, make sure that their kids feel as supported as possible um, during those times. So those are a lot of the conversations that we're um, really exploring together. Thank you for mentioning that because I think I've also received those questions from caregivers, how much to share, when to share, um, and there are different ages, of course, you know, you may have a small child at home or you may have a teenager and sometimes even a teenager may not be um, fully prepared 
uh, for some of the conversations. It doesn't always rely on the age. Uh, so I, I appreciate that information for, for folks. Could you talk a little bit more about how the process of grief might be different uh, for children than adults? Absolutely, absolutely. I think um, on the one hand, grief is really similar, um, right? We all experience grief. There's a, a wonderful um, quote from a, a real pioneer in, in um, grief work. Um, and he says, if you're old enough to love, you're old enough to grieve. And um, that really, I really hold that, um, hold that sentiment with me as I do, as I do this work. Um, and, and so I will start off by saying that just like adults, children grieve as well. Um, and it sometimes it looks different. Um, so oftentimes children don't have the words um, to explain or name what they're experiencing in their grief. Um, and so instead, just like everything else that kids um, kind of experience and process in their world, younger children especially really often process their grief through play. Um, and so it can be really common um, to see kids um, who are experiencing major loss, really playing some of that out either um, outside on the playground or maybe in art um, or maybe in some of the games that they're playing, um, you know, with their dolls or action figures. Um, so all of that is really a normal way for children to experience and process their grief. Um, and with older, you know, as I think something that's really important to think about, um, which you've mentioned a couple of times really is um, being aware of where a child is developmentally. Um, and that is really going to um, provide some insight into how we might expect them to respond um, or cope with or understand the loss. So um, there are sort of three, I won't go into too much detail, but there are sort of three main concepts that children are really trying to wrap their minds around. Um, and for younger, younger children, um, the first concept is this idea of permanency. Um, and so sometimes it's really normal and I think it's important for adults in, in their world to understand um, and be prepared for um, the possibility that their child might not understand that um, when a person dies, their physical body is dead forever. And, and that's important um, because it doesn't mean that their child isn't understanding the loss. It's just part of um, where they are developmentally. And just like everything else with that age, um, with younger ages, preschool age, um, kids or toddlers, it takes a lot of repetition, which can be really difficult um, for families and adults who are also grieving to, to um, be needing to do. Um, and it doesn't mean that your child isn't understanding what's happening. It's just part of how they're, um, how they're processing it. Um, other concepts might be um, this idea of um, universality. And so that can be helpful in beginning conversations about grief and loss, because what it means really is that all living things eventually die. Um, and in some ways that can take a little bit of the pressure off for families um, because a lot of times kids have begun these conversations in one way or another in their own worlds, right? Whether they've um, talked about the seasons changing at school, especially as we move into autumn and the leaves falling off of the trees, um, or we've, um, you know, um, seen an ant on the side of the road and talked about, you know, stepping on an ant and um, just uh, just helping families to recognize um, that kids often have more exposure to these concepts than we sometimes um, realize that they have. Um, and the last piece is functionality. And, and that means that when somebody's body dies, it's it's totally and completely stops working. And that's important for kids to understand um, because it helps them to re recognize that that person is no longer experiencing pain. 
And that's really important for children to know. I think you speak with such compassion about, you know, these these important topics and just it's such a complex dynamic because like you said, the parents or the adults, they might not necessarily be parents, grandparents, you know, they're grieving as well. And so they may be having a day, like you said, it's the repetition, you know, they may be having a day where they're feeling a little bit more strong or uh, secure in the moment and the child is experiencing their own timeline of grief and, you know, making sense of it all. Can you talk a little bit about how an older child, such as a teenager or young adult, might verbalize things or act in a way in a family setting? Absolutely. Yeah. So with older kids, um, you know, they often, well, you know, it's different for every child, right? Just like every adult experiences grief differently. And especially, um, you know, as, um, as we're talking about anticipatory grief, I think that's when I hear a lot of families feeling especially concerned about maybe their teenagers um, not sharing what they're feeling and, and families feeling worried about what's going on inside of their minds and their hearts. I wanna know, I wanna be able to, to support them. Um, and, and some teenagers really love and find it really powerful to talk about it and talk through it. And, and they might be doing that with a family member um, or they might be doing it with a neutral person at school, like a guidance counselor, or they might be doing it with friends, um, and particularly friends um, or people in their um, peer network that have experienced something similar. Um, but I would say the other, the alternative is that sometimes they don't want to talk about it um, and, and that's okay. Um, I think it's really important for families to hear that it's okay to not want to talk about it um, and to think about um, what are some of the other ways that a teenager or an older child might be processing their loss. So maybe they're locking themselves in their room, right? They close the door when they get home from school. We don't know what's going on in there, but maybe they're listening to music or they're doing art or they're connecting with friends, um, which are all really important outlets. Maybe they're at football practice and, and really experiencing a physical response. Um, so just recognizing that there are so many different ways to process and experience what's happening in somebody's world um, can be really important. And so I think with, um, with any child, of course, but especially older children, it's really important that they hear that um, what they're thinking and feeling matters and it's important um, and that the door is open to talk about it if they want to. Um, and also, to not um, kind of barge on through, right? To kind of open that door and keep it open um, and also respect any wishes that they might have to not, um, to not go there at that time. I agree. I, I agree about, you know, if they're not ready to talk, you know, and that there is no, like you said, there is no right way to grieve. Someone may shut, shut that door for a little while and someone else may be really verbal. So we have to respect each other's differences within a family, even within the same, there could be twins and one may want to talk, maybe one may not, you know, not every child is different, even in the same family. And, you know, you did mention if someone wasn't interested in sharing or talking, but if, if they are, I was curious, are there certain things we shouldn't say or words or language that we should stay away from um, to keep that door open and to encourage when they are ready that they can come to a trusted adult? That is such an important question. And I, um, I really like the way you framed it because I think sometimes we're so eager to know what is the right thing to say. Um, and I think one of the, the hardest parts about all of this is um, there really, there isn't necessarily a right thing to say because there's nothing that can fix it. There's nothing that can make these feelings go away. Um, and so instead what we wanna be thinking about is um, staying away from any kinds of statements that might feel really invalidating. Um, and of course with 
good and meaningful um, and loving intention. Um, but sometimes we say things to try to make people feel better and instead it can end up feeling invalidating. Um, so, um, you know, Brene Brown, who talks a lot about um, vulnerability, she's a, a researcher and social worker. She, um, she always says, um, rarely does an empathetic statement begin with at least. Um, and I think that's really important to keep in mind because when we say things like, at least you still have another parent, or at least you got 17 years with them, or at least they're not suffering anymore. Um, well, of course, those things are meant to help somebody feel better. Instead, what they can end up doing is um, making them feel like what they're feeling now isn't okay. Um, so we really want to try to stay away from things like that um, or from really providing any um, sort of directives on what they should be feeling um, or what they should be um, doing. Of course, we want to encourage people to take care of themselves, um, but we can do that through asking questions. Um, and we can do that through modeling um, in our own worlds um, so that they can see that. I think that's one of the biggest ways that kids learn is through seeing how the people around them are um, coping and navigating these things. Um, so I, I think um, really the most important thing is to think about um, listening but there's a wonderful book called the rabbit listen we have a picture of it on the um on the slideshow and it really talks just about that it's meant for younger children but i think it's actually a really powerful book for adults as well um and it's just about um a kid who experiences a loss and how the different uh, different animals come into his world and try to help him. Um, and ultimately it's a rabbit who just sits by his side in silence with him um, and follows his lead. Um, that ends up being the most powerful, um, powerful thing for him. You just took the words right out of my mouth, Cami. You know, just sitting with someone is is so important and not saying things that may unintentionally minimize the situation or you know, not be present in the moment with a child. I think a lot of times people want to, like you say, people want to say the right thing just to make someone feel better, but that may not always be what they need. Yeah. And I think it's perfectly okay to say to a kid, I don't know what to say right now. I, I can't imagine what it's like for you right now, but I want you to know that I'm here and I'm thinking about you and I support you and I care about you. And you're also meeting them at their emotion, which we talk a lot about with our pop, you know, with our community. Uh, I was just curious, are there certain behaviors that parents and caregivers should watch out for with children? Could you comment briefly? I know there's so much to say sure. about that. Um, and I know there are many professionals that can also assist parents and caregivers, even teachers, but I was just curious, are there any behaviors that we should know about to look out for that could be concerning? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think um, <clears throat> on the one hand, it's expected that your child might be a little bit off of their what we call a baseline, right? They're normal, um, or what you're used to seeing them as far um, as far as um, things like sleeping, eating, um, just the way that they're behaving in general, um, the way that they're expressing themselves. Um, so I would say. Um, expect to see some changes in that, right? Um, but if you're noticing things that are becoming so disruptive um, that your child maybe isn't sleeping anymore or is sleeping all day long, and that's really lasting. Um, it's not just a couple of days, right? It's, it's really lasting long-term and it's interfering with their ability to, um, you know, go to school or, or function well in school the way that they're used to, um, those would be times when I would um, really um, seek out some professional guidance. Or um, if you're noticing, especially with older kids, them engaging in new types of risky behaviors that weren't something that they were engaging in before, especially, um, you know, it's normal for teenagers to explore new things. Um, 
and so it's a, it's again a balance. Um, but I think if they're if they're just seeming like they're doing all of these things that are really different from um, maybe before um, or before the loss or bef even before even during the illness, um, if you notice drastic changes that seem to be sticking, that would be when I would reach out for for some extra support. Thank you. Yes, anything safety related i i agree you know i just i think it's so so critical that the adults are in tune with their child and and you know listening and it goes back to listening again and, and observing and so you mentioned behaviors and what's expected um you know as someone's disease may progress in the family or you know as, depending on what's happening could you talk a little bit about the timeline of grief um, so when families often ask about um, the timeline of grief, right, how long is my child going to feel this way? And I think the, um, the difficult truth is that we never stop missing and loving the people who are no longer here or who are so, so very sick and wishing they were not. Um, but grief does change over time. Um, it ebbs and it flows. Um, it, it gets more intense and less intense at different developmental milestones. Children, as they grow older, they begin to understand what it means in their world in different ways. And I think that's something really important for, um, for caring adults in their world to understand that what grief for their five-year-old might look like um, right at the very beginning it, it will change over time because that five-year-old will grow older and will understand what that loss means in their world in new ways. And so just to recognize that it, grief isn't something that goes away. It's something that we learn to carry with us and we learn ways to manage it and, and ways to hold grief and to hold joy um, together. Cammie, I have to be honest with you, your response and such a beautiful explanation has actually made me a little emotional myself. Uh, you know, I think there's so many emotions that go along with grief. And when you love someone deeply, you will always have grief. And like you say, there's no end point and there's no end point to love. And for a child, a lot of these experiences are happening at the same time that they're developing. It becomes part of their personhood and their experience. And it's just so important to have the right skills, the coping skills and, and support from the adults around us. And, and I was curious if you could shed some light on the resources that your program offers to help with that journey. And just how, you know, I, I believe that when people are grieving, that grief can be used in beautiful ways to create art, to to really go through the process. And, and like I say, grief speaks to how much you loved someone. Is there, are there programs where at, at Care Dimensions, are there programs that help children with this? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> any family is um, who has experienced um, a death loss is absolutely welcome to reach out. Um, and, you know, we will talk with you to um, get a better understanding of where your child is in their grief process to help you feel um, more prepared um, to navigate this with them. Um, and then if it's appropriate, we may be able to offer some short-term um, individual counseling um, for your child and um, or, or possibly um, involving them in some type of grief support group where they can be with peers who have had a similar experience and really learn from each other, which I think is um, perhaps the, one of the most powerful ways um, that children navigate these difficult um, experiences. And, and the other type of programming we offer is um, um, monthly um, meetings for uh, caregivers of grieving children to connect and learn from each other how they're how they are moving through this with their children how they're supporting their children um, so any any family is welcome to reach out and we can talk more in depth about um, what type of support might be most helpful for you um, where you are in your journey thank you so much 
Yes, everybody grieves differently. So it would be nice to have a consultation to see what is available, what matches up the age range, your catchment area, of course. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, you know, for the last question, is there a takeaway uh, that we can, you know, hold on to as we leave this discussion today, something you feel that we should know or we could end on? Yeah, I think, um... I think the takeaway is really, um, for me, I think I see families cope best with these types of um, situations when they really can keep the lines of communication open um, in their family. I think so often children want to protect their grownups and grownups want to protect their children. And we're so worried about saying we're doing the wrong thing um, that we unintentionally close doors. Um, but if we can keep those doors open and invite people to walk through them when they're feeling they need it or when they're feeling ready, I think that sets the family up um, for honest, um, honest conversations where they can be vulnerable and, and move through this together. I really like that takeaway message, especially about leaving the doors open and walking through them. And I wanna thank you today for your time and your expertise, your wealth of knowledge. We really appreciate you joining us. And now I'm going to turn it over to Katie Brandt. Amy and Cami, thank you both so much. You know, I'm always thinking about how brave uh, the, and resilient the members of our community must be. You know, the adults that are caring for a loved one, coping with a progressive neurological disorder, and then those same adults may be the ones to help shepherd children and teens, young adults through the grief process. That can take real bravery and strength but through everything, through the acts of caregiving, the acts of talking about the tough stuff, I see love behind every action. And it was so important, I think, today to hear words like love and joy, communication, support. It's really about staying connected. That's what we say all the time when we're talking to our caregivers. You know, a journey is easier traveled with someone by your side. So I thank you both for bringing this sensitive, emotional, and critically important topic to our Community Forum Friday webinar series. All of our sessions are recorded and posted on our MGH FTD unit YouTube channel so that families may access these important resources whenever it's relevant or informative for them. The MGH FTD unit is committed to providing the highest quality of care while working tirelessly towards a cure for these devastating conditions. We thank you all for listening, for your attention, and for being a part of our community. Until next time, be well. <laughs>